You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Well, good morning, everybody. I am Glenn Geek in Ocala, Florida. And I'm Ashley Winch in Kansas City, Missouri. And you're listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for Monday, January 22nd, episode 3348 by Worm Flooring. Good morning, Horse World. I have good news and bad news for you on this Monday morning. First, the bad. It's Monday. But the good news is really good. Jamie and Glenn are here to guide you through another week filled with horse talk and a whole lot of fun. Welcome to Horses in the Morning. Actually, it's Ashley and Glenn today. Jamie is off handling some business around the farm. She had some things she had to get taken care of. So she's doing that. Ashley, thank you for filling in. Appreciate it. I'm always happy to be here. And don't worry, everybody. It's nothing bad. Everything's fine. So uh, she just had some things she had to get done. You know, things things happen on the farm when you don't want them to happen. That's when they happen. And this That's time, it's not a vet bill. That's the only time they happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this time, this one won't require, uh, require a vet bill. So today, Joshua Hale is joining us from Alaska Horse Adventures to tell us about caring for and riding horses in Alaska in the winter. Deanne from Horse Nation stops by to discuss some of the interesting articles that they have over there. And I did a Horses in History. I always do this when Ashley's here because she's actually interested. Jamie could care less about history. (laughs) So we're going to talk about the stables of the Roman Empire. We're going to go back a ways. And yes, poop will probably be involved. Oh, great. Seems to be my theme this year. (laughs) (laughs) And in the post show, it's been a long time when, when AI and chat GPT came out. Uh, We did some, uh, we did some, uh, AI on ourselves, you know, do bios on ourselves. And it was totally wrong. I mean, it wasn't even close. So today I did it on you and I to see if it got closer. Oh, I'm uh, excited. So, so we're going to do that in the post show. We'll talk AI and whoever, whatever else we get up to. We'll do that in the post show. Plus, maybe in the post show too, we'll also talk about all the fun things we have going on over the next couple of weeks. It's a lot of fun. We'll go over that. And this week's (laughs) going to be a busy one for you and I. So let's get it started with some Daily Winnies. (laughs) We have a bunch of auditor birthdays today. Uh, Kaylin Schildmeyer. Deanne Whitlock, Martha Coors, Lisa Cheeseman, and Tigger from Healthy Critters Radio. Happy birthday to all of you. We hope you have a great day. If you want to become an auditor and have your birthday read, just go to Horses in the Morning, click on the auditor banner, and for as little as $3 a month, you can join the party in the auditor room. I have a very exciting Daily Winnie today. And Glenn, my Daily Winnie goes out. Wait a minute. Stop. Okay. You're underplaying that. There are Daily Winnies and then there's this Daily (laughs) Winnie. Okay. It's a pretty big Daily Winnie. (laughs) And I'm I'm burying the lead because I am – my my Winnie goes out to you, Glenn, Jennifer, and Jamie – And an auditor, Megan Lapkoff, because you all have been helping me keep a little secret. And some of you might have seen from my personal Facebook page, if you're my friend, which you're welcome to friend me if you'd like, uh, I made an announcement that I I just, I couldn't keep this secret in any longer. I think, Glenn, you've been helping me keep this under wraps since November through radio it's been a while (laughs) it's been a long time so i am just so very excited to finally share that zach and i are expecting a baby (laughs) is that how zach felt about it right there (laughs) i mean there was some crying if we're gonna be honest congratulations 
Oh my gosh, we're so excited. Uh, we It was a long road to get here and um, we just, we couldn't be happier. We got to see the baby on an ultrasound um, last week and he was just flipping, punching away. He has very strong legs. So I told the nurse, <laughs> good, he'll <Fourth> be, <laughs> he'll be a rider. That's, we oh, love so to it see is a it. he? Oh, whoops. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're waiting for the blood work to come back. But you uh, said we, it. I just picked it up. We did get a view of a, a special part between the mm. legs that dictate. I don't know how you could. You sent me the pictures and I was like, I see a head. Uh, well, I didn't you know. send you that one because, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, you got to that's a little uh, that's a little I don't know. <laughs> Nobody wants to look at that. <laughs> It does so look can, like a baby. He he looks like a very cute baby. Even the nurse said that. And I said, ma'am, I know you say that to everyone. You're not fooling me for a minute. <laughs> now, I now I included Megan Lapkoff, one of our auditors in my Daily Winnie, because, and this is a horse girl hack for all my girlies out there. I am planning a Western themed nursery because we also will be moving out West. Uh, more details. Rider? Yeah. Well, sh- just let me get through <laughs> it. I ride Western. I trained a Mustang. I can, I can do the cowgirl thing. I've sorted cattle. Are you bringing your hat to Podfest? No, because I got, I, it's going to mess up my hair. Oh yeah. And you know what? Traveling with a cowboy hat sucks. <laughs> and I already have my floppy hats in my bag. So okay. we're just, we're, there's not room for hats in, in my luggage this trip. <laughs> but so for my nursery, we're doing the Western theme and I contacted Megan who also sells, uh, she has a consignment tax store and got a gorgeous, uh, Western fringy martingale and headstall and three kind of antique bits that I'm going to frame. So all this to say, girls, if you get knocked up, <laughs> have an equestrian themed nursery so you can buy more horse stuff. <laughs> You're welcome. How does Zach feel about this, by the way? He knows far better than to have an opinion. <laughs> Let's let's just be real honest. He know he just says, "Oh, that'll be so cute." Oh, that'll be so cute. You're doing it all. Right. <laughs> As about he picked up the bits yesterday, and he was like, "Wait, how does this go in the horse's mouth?" Because you know they have the long, long shanks. Oh that, yeah, some of those old bits are nasty yeah, looking. Yeah, and he, I had to explain it to him, and <clears throat> pardon me. He just goes, oh, my gosh, that looks like it would hurt. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, that's why, that's we why it's an antique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why we don't use those anymore. Well, so I know this is something that you've uh, you've wanted for a very long time. Yes, it is. And and I just have to share one one funny one off. Um, okay. When we were recording Radiothon, for everybody who ter- tuned in, um, when we had our quiz segment with our two guests, the comedian, Pam, she <laughs> shared a story I'm about. I... Oh, this is so triggering for me about turkey butt sandwiches. I don't know if you guys remember that from Radiothon. I'll certainly never forget it because I almost had to get up and run out of the bathroom and, and uh, worship the porcelain throne. And she had that. We had to do that story twice. I don't. I don't remember why we had to stop and re-record it. It but. was the <laughs> most disgusting. It was this sandwich. I can barely say it with I like mean, you were, literally. We were afraid a turkey of you butt. making this through the whole day because you were getting sick and un, because you have to be weird and different. You were getting sick in the afternoons. That's right. Yes. I didn't have morning sickness. I had evening sickness, and I, you know, I had all my mocktails going, and I was trying to play it cool, and then this turkey butt sandwich. <laughs> She really I, did almost lose it. I really did, guys. It was so bad. Uh, but otherwise made it through the first trimester without getting sick, just really tired and kind of nauseous and icky. And now I'm in the second trimester, ready to go on my cruise. You were a trooper that day. And this was your first Radiothon, and you were co-hosting the whole day. So you really were a trooper. I mean, it's tiring you know, too. Uh, you know, it's not. It's it is tiring to do it all day and beyond. And you were doing things behind the scenes too. So it it uh, you 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 hung in there. It's a it's a good thing I'm a horse girl. We're real tough. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, having all this Western themed stuff, he's going to end up like being a fighter pilot or something, right? Oh gosh. <laughs> 
Uh, listen, at this point, Zach was a big wrestler through high school and college. Like he he did nationals. He did, he it was like that was his thing. So I I just need to make sure this baby doesn't wrestle. Can I That's talk really... about how ungirly you are? <laughs> yes, you can. So first thing Ashley says is they're not having one of those stupid parties for me. <laughs> Nobody's having a baby was a baby shower. Nobody's having yeah. a baby shower for me. I I think they're stu- you are the most ungirly girl. <laughs> it's true. I mean in a lot of ways you're very girly. But yes. then like, in, in other ways like this girly. is like I don't want to put up with that crap. <laughs> Who wants to take time to do that? <laughs> I hate baby showers. No offense to <laughs> All the moms out there who loved theirs or people who love hosting them, like, God bless you. It's just the worst party. Oh, I think Jennifer had been to one in her life. Now, Jennifer is renowned for, you know, never wanting kids and not dealing with little kids. The only time she's ever babysat in her life was she, we were at the family's house and her dad's house or something. And everybody left and she was stuck with the baby. The baby and her were the <laughs> only two there. a surprise. There. Everybody left, literally left, and she all of a sudden was there with the baby, and that, and I guess they just expected her to take care of it. Fortunately, after an hour and a half, the baby was still alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's as much babysitting as she ever did. <laughs> I grew up lots of babysitting and lots of that stuff, and I am like a girly girl. Like I like getting dressed up and all that stuff, but I think like a lot of our listeners out there, like the other side of me, like – when I grew up, I would get my mom cut off all my hair because I wouldn't brush it and I had sticks in it. <laughs> and she's like, if you don't brush your hair, I'm going to cut it all up. I'm like, good, do it. <laughs> so I looked like a boy till I was at least nine. <laughs> Have you ever had long hair? Um, When I was like low 20s, it went down to like my mid back. And I am growing it a little bit now because I figure I won't want to do my hair with a brand new baby. So at least I can throw it up. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, because I'm late. If anything, I'm late. So when are you due again? I'm due in July, July 21st. A summer baby. A summer baby um, and, you know, to Equine Network's chagrin, that's right after my one year mark and lucky Glenn, I'll be gone for three months. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I, that I have to figure out yet. <laughs> I do have to I'm figure very, that one out yet. No, I'm very but grateful. I'm Zach also will have three months of paternity leave from the Air Force, which is a pretty new. Yeah, I was going to um, say, I've never heard of that before. Yeah, they changed it, I want to say a year or two ago. I think it used to be like two weeks, honestly. <laughs> So and don't don't tell Jamie I brought that up because it's a very sore spot between her and Chad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, nobody mentioned that. Nobody tell Jamie. OK. <laughs> well, congratulations. We're excited to see the little baby when it comes. Thank you. You know what? If you ditch the mats and upgrade to worm flooring, you will be very happy camper. It's a constant struggle with heavy rubber mats. You know, we we had to do that with ours last week because Nigel insists on peeing on the seam every single time. So, And we hadn't done it in a year. So we picked up the mats, and Jennifer did, and cleaned underneath and did all of that. But we're going to be happy when we don't have to do that anymore after we get our worm flooring put in our trailer. Do you crave a more durable, easy-to-clean flooring solution for your trailer, barn, or any space? commercial or residential worm flooring systems is here to revolutionize your floors say goodbye to rubber mats and say hello to no more liquid seeping through a slip resistant grip cushioned comfort extreme durability and reduced noise worm flooring systems the perfect choice for applications all over your horse property yes they do stalls they do feed rooms they do tack rooms they do vet uh, clinics, they do it all. And it, WORM stands for We Eliminate Rubber Mats. And you can go to WORM, W E R M, flooring.com. And joining us now is Joshua Hale from Alaska Horse Adventures in Palmer, Alaska. Now, Joshua, I am a Florida girly currently living in the Midwest. I hate everything snow and cold. First and foremost, I just have to ask the temperatures right now, what, what's a normal day in caring for your horses look like before we get into the nitty gritty of all your adventures? It's been about uh, right around between zero and 10 below here for the last week. We've had a pretty even winter. It hasn't been too bad. We saw a little bit of 25 below. Um, but we're right here in the central part of the state in Palmer. So 
Um, we're not down on a coast where it's really rainy and, and wet, and we're not up really far up north where it's 50, 60 below. It makes it sound like they're having the a heat wave. <laughs> yeah, like, no big deal. Just a casual negative yeah, 10. It's only but... negative 10. We're good. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I actually enjoy cold weather like that. It's crisp and it's cold, and once it stays cold enough for a little bit while, for a little while, the the moisture freezes, and it's not as bad as it is when it's high moisture and ten degrees. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Like the wet cold versus a dry cold kind of thing. Yeah. So tell me, it, how did you how did you get started with your horse farm out there in Palmer, Alaska, and what kinds of challenges did you face getting started? Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking horse business here, right? <laughs> That's right. You're in the um, right Well, place. I grew up, I actually grew up in New Mexico. My dad raised uh, me and my 14 siblings in the Rocky Mountains of New Mexico. So we, uh, we grew up with horses and in the mountains and kind of, kind of, uh, used to rough winters and then moved to Alaska in like 99 and then didn't have horses for a couple of years. And from there we, uh, kind of started a small trail ride company because we needed horses to get up in the mountains for some property that we bought. And we started a, a small uh, trail ride company in uh, McCarthy, Alaska, where we did um, tours there. And then in 06, we moved to Palmer and I worked here as a farrier, a uh, horseshoe, and I traveled the circuits of the state shoeing horses for all the big hunting outfits and the trail ride outfits um, here. And then was working for an outfit shoeing their group of horses in Anchorage. And then he kept talking about getting out of it. So I ended up kind of buying him out, sort of the deal, taking over that business in Anchorage of 2011. And then faced a lot of challenges doing it. Even though it's Alaska, Anchorage is not always that friendly to horse activities and renting trails and where to keep horses and city ordinances and all that stuff. So we ended up moving it out towards Palmer here where I live almost closed the business in 2014 due to just the challenges of where the other company was operating and it just wasn't working for me the way I wanted to run the company and uh, actually I was planning to close the company in 2014 and the phone kept ringing and so I had like 15 horses a truck and a trailer that was paid off and I started meeting my clients at the river um, to, uh, do just to meet them, to do the trail rides. I just explained to them that we weren't doing them in a regular location anymore. We're doing them another one. So I had an actually really busy year that year. It was just me and 15 horses and a truck and a trailer. And, wow. uh, it went good. Everybody called and I would ask them for the credit card information. I never wrote a single credit card number down because, um, <laughs> they just thought I had it. So they would show up <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> It ended up being it ended up being one of my most profitable years because I didn't have any employment. I didn't have any. I didn't have a ton of overhead. And then from there, we oh, leased boy, a piece of property. A ton of work dealing with all those horses, loading them up yourself, doing everything. Yeah, it was just. I don't know. I had a good little system going. I did like. I did uh, six days a week, and uh, didn't have time to spend money. Just just enough time to buy some hay and <laughs> saddle horses. That was it. <laughs> That'll keep your costs down. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then from there, we leased some property. And then the people that I was leasing from approached me one day and wanted to know if I wanted to buy 13 acres that they had for sale. And so we ended up doing that. And that property gets us access to the backside of the Knick River Valley, which is a really, really, really cool valley. It's got sandy beaches along the river where you can see the glacier in the back of the canyon um we're right up next to pioneer peak and then there's a whole other portion of the valley that's got a bunch of swamp lakes which we do some um water tours horseback water tour combined situations so i mean challenges are ongoing everlasting with a business like this in alaska but um Say the biggest challenge I face is the off season, about six months of the year, just trying to trying to keep the the company, you know, with income. We're up to like sixty eight horses right now. Wow. Um, two full time employees. Um Do you do and, any tours uh, in the winter? Yeah, we do sleigh rides. Oh, cool. And we do trail rides. We actually have a, a quite a large I wouldn't say it's a large number, but we do 
two or three horseback rides a week, maybe. Um, they're just local people want to get out and do mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, so, that's so cool. So I know on your site, and you've mentioned you have your trail rides, winter trail rides, kayaking, sleigh rides. Of all of your adventures, do you have a favorite story or a most memorable uh, trail ride? I mean, the first thing I think of, of course, is bears or or some kind of crazy Alaskan wildlife that is interested in me and my horses. So I have to know if you have a, a fun story you have. Um, boy, have should have plenty of them. Um, I had a had a fun uh, adventure this, uh, which I kind of got a video of it on my uh fa- on my Instagram and Facebook. Um, I also transport hunters in and out of the mountains in the fall, so that's kind of a really hard, grueling, labor intensive time. At the same time, it's really fun time of the year for me because I like I meet hunters at uh, trailheads all through uh September and then they ride up um, to where they're hunting is that so yeah. I pack them into the mountains I'll pack them like 10 miles in the mountains and drop them off and then they hunt so there there should be their own group of experienced hunters and I'm just a transporter so I'll take them up drop them off with all their camp gear and everything they have And I leave them and then they hunt on foot and then I'll go back and pack them and their, and their game out. Mostly it's moose, you know, mostly just residents, uh, subsistently hunting. Um, a lot of it's draw hunt areas and areas where you're not allowed to use airplanes or you can't get airplanes to get into and stuff like that. So they need horses to get up into these canyons and, uh, and so I do do a lot of that. And so sometimes I'll have a trip every single day for like 20 days. And so it gets pretty uh, gets pretty in, intense on that. I bought a semi truck this year and a big trailer that gives me and the horses space to uh, like get back to the trailer, have food and water and a place to sleep and comfortable place to spend the night. So I'm not actually doing so much traveling back to the ranch and stuff like that. So that made this year a bit easier. Um, but this year I went into this one valley and there's this really bad Creek that, uh, is washed. Out. It got washed out. It's not a very big Creek. It's not that much water, but it just cut way down into the rocks from some, all the rain that we had. And so you got to go down this little sh- shale kind of rocky turn, getting down into the water where we get up the other side, getting down in there is fine. It kind of slide down through there. I think I had a string of like 12 mules. Um, because he is primarily just mules for my packing. And uh, got in, got to the hunters, got them loaded up, and went out to where their meat was hanging to pick it up. And and I hear some commotion, and out of the brush comes this brown bear just just coming, splitting right at the right at the mules. And I was just like, okay, he's going to bluff charge and stop. And then he gets to some brush, and then he just jumps around that brush. So uh, I have a bigger rifle that I use for, uh, um, well, I've never used it actually. Um, but I was going to, I was getting it out in case something like that happened. So I kind of abandoned that one, getting it out of the scabbard because I have time and I pulled my, my, uh, my pistol out and I, I put a shot towards him and he said to go ahead and run on down the mountain, but he was within, I think probably 20 yards of us oh, or if closer. He wouldn't have had that, he would have gotten something. Wow. Yeah, he was I, I don't I he was determined. He was coming at a string of twelve mules and three guys. Oh. Um and I saw him stop and then he's like and then I he sort of paused and he's like, Oh, you're not gonna leave, so I'm gonna still come and I was like, Okay, well it's on then. But normally right normally the, you know you're right that quickly you cannot get a rifle out. I mean, it just, yeah, you know, I already had my hand on the rifle. Yeah. And then I was like, hey, there's no way I'm getting this out. In time. <laughs> it's an AR style. So it's, it's normally they don't come at me with the horses. Normally they'll kind of like, you know, they'll kind of, yeah, you, you know, wander yeah. around and they see that, you know, we're a big group and they kind of will walk off and sometimes they'll put a shot towards them just in the brush to just let them know that, you know, we really want them to go away. But, uh, <clears throat> This one was, uh, was a little about vicious. Something. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't want to share his gut pile. 
<laughs> you know what was happening? She was at home going, I'm hungry and you haven't fed me in forever. And he's like, I'm going to, I, I got to get this done or I'm out. And, you know, there was nothing getting his way. 12 mules, nothing. <laughs> yeah. So that was an adventure day. And then on the way back out, it was a bit of a deal getting uh, through, back through that canyon. I had, uh, well, I kind of had a, a newer mule that hasn't really, really experienced an amount. She's really good, but she didn't get up that one little shale piece and slid back down Ooh. and uh, got jammed up. And I was really scared because there's a lot of rocks and a lot of sharp rocks. And then she ended up, uh, she, she, she cut one leg just barely and that uh, was fine. But she hopped back around and stayed calm. And then I ended up being able to one by one get all the mules through the but. That was probably my most, that was my scariest pack trip of the season. I was afraid I was going to end up with a hurt mule, but I gotta ask you, we made it out. With your horses, uh, now take out the driving horses. I noticed you're using some percherons and things for the driving. Um, yeah. What, what, is there a breed you prefer for the, for the winter weather? Is there a hardy breed for winter weather and winter tra- trail riding? Well, um, mules are obviously really hardy. We actually use our mules for trail rides. Um, uh, a lot of our clients don't even realize they're mules. A lot of them are just like, oh, wow, this horse is so cute. He has big ears <laughs> and, uh, we don't, uh, we don't spoil it for him. But, uh, well, there's this, there's this sort of stigma and, you know, especially like even around people that have never ridden a horse or a mule before and they'll see a mule and they'll go, oh, they kick and they're mm-hmm. stubborn. They're right. Nasty. And it's like, yeah. it's like no (laughs) you know i love mules um i'm really split between depends on what i'm doing i guess i really 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 like my mules like i just like they're personal with me and like one of my lead mules that i ride a lot i I actually put clients on him in the mountains now bombo um like he wants a hug if i haven't seen him for a while like he just simply will put his he just like if i haven't seen him for a while he comes over and just puts his head on me um, so like, we're, we're like, there's this like family relationship I got going on with my mules. Horses are the same, but not quite as much as that really, once they get connected, they're like really connected. Um, I'm a big fan of the Pertrons. I really, really like Pertrons a lot. They're just, I don't know. They're just really cool horses. Uh, yeah. I've had a, I've owned a couple. I'm also a, you know, a carriage driver. I don't ride. So yeah. the Pertrons, it's just gentle. They are, truly are gentle giants. I mean, they really are. And, and they just have a lot of enthusiasm yeah. and they work really hard and they're really smart and they learn quick. And, uh, right now we're, we're, we're working on training. Like we have five, Pertron Philly crosses that I brought in out of Canada. I'm really enjoying them. So to answer your question, the draft cross horses are probably your best Alaskan horse. Um, of course, Icelandics are big up here, which I don't have any of. Um, believe it or not, my one of my favorite horses for what we do with the, with the company is Tennessee Walkers. We have uh, about 17, 18, I think, Tennessee Walkers. Well, I believe um, that. I mean, they use those for hunting down here. You know, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call them like a really hardy horse, but they've done really, really well here. Of course, I don't have fancy ones. I'm not like buying <laughs> like show show walkers. I'm just just wanting a grade walker. And I have found them to be very people friendly. Um, none of them buck ever for even when I'm starting them and training them and stuff like that. And just and they're smooth. You know, people aren't bouncing up and down the saddle every time the horse, you know, makes a little faster move. And so they've worked out really, really well for us. And I just, I'm, their temperaments and uh, behavior has been very people friendly, client conducive. I mean, I like quarter horses, but they're, some of them are a little bit advanced, you know, Mm -hmm. and they're Mm -hmm. just breeding and their movements. I mean, sometimes quarter horses move so fast and, you know, and, and, and it's good. That's why we breed them. That's why we like them. But for what I do, sometimes that that ability to move that quick, you know, in an instant would just put a client right off to the side if, a, you know, if they jump a little bit or something. But Is that's there, pretty much our... I, I, you know, we have time for one more question. I want to ask you about winter okay. care for your horses. Do you just feed them more? Do you, you know, is there anything special you do? You know, obviously everywhere. I mean, right now, some <coughs> state, a lot of states in the United States are colder than you are. Um, but uh, yeah, what do you do? What do you do to take care of them? Um, not a lot, to be honest, um, because I really tried to 
to teach my horses to mentally and physically adjust. And if a horse can't, you know, I normally pass them off to someone that, that's got a little bit more of a system for that. Um, I try not to coat my horses unless they're uh, visually cold. Um, we kind of keep them in a uh, fenced in wooded area where they have some shelter and stuff like that and have decent areas to move around. And of course, they're all, the, well, probably about 40 something of them are in the same pen together. Um, and so we roll two big round bales out for them each day with a, with a tractor. So two a and, day? Uh, yeah. Yeah, two a day for that group. And then we have uh, eight ponies that I care for at my house. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have a, a Tennessee Walker Stallion. He stays separate, obviously. And, you know, anybody that needs extra care, we pull them aside um, and we'll take care of them extraly. But I really want my horses to both adjust and to stay adjusted so if you if you if you get them too used to a certain level of care within their body and mentality adjust to that so uh i'm trying to keep my horses trying to keep a tougher group of horses that are you know that also have a survival mentality as they and they do better they stay healthier that way yes. and i'm a big advocate of trying to keep horses as naturally cared for as possible without too many vitamins, too much extra stuff, um, too much extra foot care type of stuff like that. We run, I've actually got most of my herd. I didn't put shoes on anybody this year. We're not running on really rocky ground, but you know, even as a farrier, I don't really shoe them a whole lot of run them barefoot if I can't, you know, unless they really, really need it. And after a couple of years of that, their feet actually adjust um, and they're to where they, they toughen up. So that's kind of the, it's kind of a long-term goal. Just to, you know, we keep realize my horses and tough. we've said for the last 14 years that we spoil our horses way too much, and I'm yeah. guilty of that too. So <laughs> I get it. Uh, and I, I also understand why you have to do what you do. You know, you have to. Um, yeah. Or else you're, you're going to have sicker horses than if you didn't. Yeah. yeah. Like my babies, my babies, I leave them in the woods with as many logs and stuff to step over and navigate around as possible. Um, Especially my Tennessee walkers, because Tennessee walkers, if they are raised on too flat a ground, they trip. Mm. So, uh, so I keep all my Tennessee walker foals constantly until they're two or three years old, stepping over as much stuff as possible, like nonstop. Is the the rougher the train I can keep them in, the better. Well, we're running out of time. This is absolutely fascinating, and we could talk to you all day. It's alaskahorseadventures.com. Yeah. If you're heading to Alaska and want an adventure, they have all kinds of things. I love the fact that you also do carriages and wagons and, and uh, driving in addition to <clears throat> kayaking and everything else that you do. Um, so, so good on you for doing that. I've been to, uh, by you, actually. Uh, we went oh, to cool. Wasilla, and then uh, I think we stopped it. We scooted up to Palmer, too. Uh, but, I mean, everywhere you go up there is just a – you drive over a hill, and it's another postcard. It's just the postcard <laughs> after postcard in Alaska. It's absolutely I know. It's amazing. Cool. It's awesome. Uh, so, alaskahorseadventures.com. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it, Joshua. Yep. All right. All right. You have Take a good care. day. Thanks for calling. Yeah, right. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. Does that make you want to go to Alaska? No. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you, Joshua. Maybe in the summer. <laughs> thank you, Joshua. Oh, I, he's, uh, he's gone. Yeah. No, uh, I know, but I, I'm glad he's out there doing it. But <laughs> what uh, a cool yeah, guy no. Too. I I can't I I was on mute laughing so hard he's like yeah so I talking about the bear charging him he's like let's go. <laughs> That's like, the kind of guy I want guiding my tour in Alaska. Charging you, and you're like, let's dance, yeah. baby. <laughs> That's the God. guy I want. <laughs> wow. Just wow. <laughs> All right. Tell us about Cosequin, and I'm going to get Deanne from Horse Nation on. Cosequin ASU joint and hoof pellets contain quality ingredients to support joint and hoof health and leave out the fillers, molasses and alfalfa, all while delivering the taste horses love. The colors of our ingredients shine through for a difference you can see. Visit CosequinEquine.com. Hey, Deanne from Horse Nation. How are you surviving up there? You're in Pennsylvania, right? Yes, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It has been kind of actual winter for the past couple weeks, which we didn't really have last year. Well, Palmer, um, Alaska, the guy we just had on was minus 10. Are you close to that? Yeah, no, he wins. <laughs> 
<laughs> Although he hasn't won in a lot of the states recently. Um, yeah, no kidding. Um, no, we're like actually today. It's it's today is warm. Right now it's like twenty, oh, wow. and it's supposed to get up to mid thirties by evening, and then we are getting high fifties by the end of the week, and we're going back to mud season. Oh, geez. You get excited for the warm temperatures and then you remember the mud that comes with it. And then you're like, oh, and honestly, I'm not even excited for the warm temperatures. Like (laughs) I'm vaguely excited to not have my toes be cold. But I think I knew I like didn't even have to think about it to be like, I'm going to be up to my knees in mud. Yeah. Well, and the um, swings aren't good, you know, with extreme yeah. swings, right. which, you know, we we tend to get a lot of extreme swings down here, but up north, it, it matters more. So Right, yeah. right. And, and just to make life super fun, as if, like, the, like, mud from melting snow weren't enough, it's supposed to rain for the next three days starting tomorrow. You have an article here that I wanted to talk <laughs> about, <laughs> and it's a controversy right now, and it seems like this one comes up, like, every three or four years. Uh, Yeah. You know, so uh, let's talk about mash or no mash. And does it decrease or increase the risk of colic? And we're talking about worm mash. Right. So pretty much all the literature from AAEP to everyone researching it at all is saying it does not decrease the risk of colic. And if you give it inappropriately, it can actually increase the risk not so much of like impaction or like twisted gut colic but like of stomach upset gas colic well, what do you mean because you, if you feed them too much of anything they're going to get sick oh yeah especially yeah. like new foods <laughs> in Breaking case news. In, yeah. it, it, Study if, show. if you got your first horse this week <laughs> fyi <laughs> <laughs> why? I, I wonder why this has come up now. It's cold. That's why it's come up now. Um, it's cold. But, you know, we've always fe- f- fed warm mash. Uh, and it's just you do it. You do it wisely. Well, right. And I like with my own horses, I have a tendency. So especially in the winter, a lot of my horses are um, supplemented with alfalfa pellets or cubes um, or compressed alfalfa. I have a tendency to add warm water to that because it just, you know, okay, here, I'm giving you something warm. Now I feel like yeah, a good we mother, do but, we do but also cubes, I'm, even yeah, we, yeah, but also yeah. I'm not changing your diet a whole lot. Right. <laughs> yeah. We tend to do the cubes too, uh, to do it that way. And it just ends up with this mush. Yeah. Right. Right. But the warm mash thing, basically it comes down to like, one horses metabolize heat differently and the best way to warm up your horse is you know to keep food keep forage in front of it and two to make sure they have a solid water source like right like this is not breaking news but for some reason this always comes up um and then the other piece which i actually thought was really interesting you know especially if you're doing like a warm oat mash and it's outside of the horse's regular diet is that it's really high in phosphorus So if you don't balance it with calcium, you can create kind of massive problems. Hmm. Um, But, you know. This is interesting. Right after the conversation Ashley and I just had with the guy from Alaska who has 80 horses that in rural Alaska. And we asked how he takes care of them in the winter. And he said, and basically it was, don't fuss with them. Give them a lot of hay. He gives them a lot of hay. They have access to water because, you know, he has water sources up there. And and they're on their own. They eat hay and they drink water and they live. (laughs) <laughs> you know, right, right. Uh, and you know, and he, he was, I don't know, Ashley, if you got this feeling, but he was kind of, a, I could hear him just thinking, and you guys all spoil your horses too damn much. And he's right. I mean, he is not wrong about that. Um, right, right. <laughs> but you could just, in his tone, he didn't say it. He's too polite for that. But I was just hearing that in my head. I don't know if Ashley felt the same way. Yeah, but, yeah. He, he was just very much like the minimalist approach, yeah. you know, Um I think Which sometimes I with our horses, we do think too much. Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And I actually have an article on, like, the um, back burner in my mind, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but <laughs> cause, And that's where most of them exist. Let's get real. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to be like, yo, Flicka does not need 10 new halters and 15 new sheets. You know what Flicka needs is, like, veterinary care and 
a well-rounded diet. <laughs> like, yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's pretty much it. You know, it, you have a, there's a quote in here from one of the veterinarians, Bob Judd. And, you know, he says brand mash is more closely related to oats and should be considered more as a grain rather than a fiber. And I think that's something we forget too. Right. Right. And I think exactly. And, and it's one of those things too, when you think about like the volume of what you're feeding your horses and it's one thing I try to impress with some of my boarders who like to randomly show up and supplement their horses with things where I'm like, that's great, but make sure you're thinking about this is again, knowing whether what you're giving them is a concentrate or a grain or a fiber like slash forage, because it makes a big difference in terms of how much you give them and what it can do to them. Well, it's just a good article. If uh, if if you also have an opinion on that, head on over to Horse Nation and look for the article. It is titled Mythbuster Monday, Feeding More Mash in the Winter Decreases the Risk of Colic. It was from today, too. So Yeah, it's, it's a fresh one. On the page, you can comment right there and uh, check that out. It was a good conversation to be had. And now the next one. It's the, the, you, got, you brought two zingers to us today. Uh, and this one's titled, and this was from December 7th. So this one goes back. It's one you wrote called a note on business and friendship in the horse world. Can you talk to us about what prompted this and basically <laughs> what did your study show? Well, and I, I always want to be a little bit careful, right? Just because I don't want to like, I don't want to make it personal when it doesn't need to be personal, but we, um, but you know, we're all, those of us in the horse industry, we all, and I say this in the article, we all know that if we're not, if we're at all equine professionals, um, that our business and our lives are so heavily intertwined with our passion and our hobby, and therefore our friendships and our relationships, that it becomes really complicated, right? And I don't know, you know, I don't know about you, but like, well, and you guys, like me, like your network has gotten huge with your podcast, and in the same way with with Horse Nation my network keeps expanding, which is awesome in so many ways and true also with my showing. But the problem then becomes, I know a lot of farriers. I know a lot of dentists. I know a lot of veterinarians. I know a lot of body workers and you can only patronize so many people. And by patronize, I don't mean, you know, talk down to, although that's fun too. Um, <laughs> but like, but you don't have to hire more than one farrier for your horse. Is that what you're saying? Well, right. Yeah. And, and, and I would argue that you should not. Um, <laughs> that's how you get both of them to fire you. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, we, we all have all these choices. And as an equine professional myself, like, you can't, you can't take people's choices personally. Or... You know, or if you think it is personal, there's a professional way to reach out and be like, hey, you know, what can I do to improve my business model or whatever? But I feel like the the minute we start really taking our friends or associates um, choice to use somebody else as an affront, then, you know, like our network's going to become a lot smaller. And we're going to build a really poor reputation. And this was prompted by someone purchasing that I know very closely, purchasing an item from one salesman and not the other. And of course, it resulted in like passive aggressive Facebook posts and unfriending. And we were all like, are we are we 12? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, where you see this probably the most is in the boarding and training situation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you see it the most. And, and it's very difficult from... You know, we tend, we as a group, tend to look at it from the person being trained or boarding their horse. But having done the other side, where I wasn't a trainer, mm -hmm. but we ran a boarding stable, having done the other side, that's where it even becomes more difficult because you have to make hard decisions, raising the board, uh, kicking people out, all of that stuff. And yeah, we're... Let's face it. We make friends wherever we go. Your place of employment, you make a lot of friends, right? That's where you right, make your friends. Right. So, it, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in life. The place you are the most is where you make friends. And, you know, we just happen to be in the barn or, you know, with other barn people or with other people showing. And I think the hard part is, and this is something that Jennifer and I had to learn very early on, and we've been pretty good about this, even through Horse Radio Network, is business is business. 
It's been, right. you know, business is business, friendship is friendship. I'll give you a perfect example. I don't, Ashley won't mind this, I don't think. You know, <laughs> Ashley and I and, and Jennifer, we've all become friends since Ashley started working here. Yes, we work together and business is business. And the way we, we keep those separate is we tend to text each other about personal things if we're doing something personally, like she's coming in, we're visiting or whatever. We do that by text and everything else is by email. Um, so we kind, you kind of have to draw the line between what's business and what's not. And when you're in business, business is business. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's still absolutely get done, right. And, and I, I feel think, like, you, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Ashley, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think the tough part is getting everybody on board with that, right? It, it, it is that people not taking it personal, but them putting on everybody else's shoes and having a little bit of empathy and seeing it from the other side. Because if we can delineate business as business and friendship as friendship, then it all just goes smoother for everybody involved. Oh, absolutely. So I, I, in addition to some of the other things I do, I also run a small boarding barn, but even before I took it over from my good friend who ran it before me, um, I, I always remembered her saying when people get ready to leave with boarding, especially you always know kind of two months before they give you their 30 days notice because they get weird. They go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They start well, pulling back. They, yeah. And they, and even if they don't totally ghost you, they, they just start acting weird. And you want, and I always sort of laugh because I, I actually have one boarder right now who I kind of keep waiting for the 30 days notice. Um, and, and we'll see, <laughs> but, you know, I, I always want to be like the best thing anyone can do. And we cannot, we all say this and haha, beat the proverbial dead horse is just be upfront. Like not all boarding situations are the right fit for every horse or every horse owner. And that's also true of any service you decide to use or not use. And it's, I find with boarding, it gets to be a little bit different, but I, I find it rarely has to do with the person providing the service themselves and has more to do with what works financially for the customer or what works in terms of management for the horse or whatever. But, it, you know, it, it does become difficult. Like we had um, one, I guess I would now call her an associate, but had been a friend at the barn that when she left again, she goes to us for like months afterwards and you want to be like, Hey, like we're still here. Like it's fine. <laughs> but you know, I, on the other side of that, um, our best friends today who we travel with around the world and go on trips with the most, another couple are, are a couple who was boarders with us 35 mm -hmm. years ago. They were our boarders and became our best friends. She ended, they ended up moving and taking the horses away. Uh, but we stayed, they're our best friends to today. So you can, you can meet people that get it and you stay lifelong friends, no matter what happened on the business side. And, but, right. but isn't that true right. of where you work too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think as long as you, and, you know, we kind of morph this into boarding specifically, but no matter what it is, I think as long as you kind of leave professionally and on good terms, like don't, don't burn the place burn down when you walk out, yeah, right. you sure. know, yeah. give your notice, pay your bill, you know, say why you're leaving or not. It doesn't matter. It's not really my business why you're leaving, <laughs> you know, and, and continue to function as a, an adult and probably everyone's yeah. going to be fine. I, you know, I'm someone who hates confrontation and, and I use that word, maybe it's not even the right word, right? Because none of this should be a confrontation, but something I, I think is really important to remember, you know, if you are the boarder who wants to leave, you've been there 10 years, you feel like family, you're worried you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. A five minute uncomfortable conversation is so much better than months and months and months and months of being uncomfortable when everybody oh, just wants you to be happy, you know? Right. Right. And like, and I even, I feel like sometimes as a barn manager, I take it a step further and sort of open the door for them, not in terms of kicking out, because I'll, I'll do that. But in terms of like, where I feel them getting weird, I'll be like, hey, you know, whatever. Flicka looks like whatever is bothering her today is bothering her again. If, hey, if you feel like 
this isn't the right fit for her, no problem. Let me know. I'm happy to provide assistance. <laughs> so I always am like, go ahead. Like I'm giving you the opportunity to have this conversation. <laughs> and, you know, there are situations on the other side. Of, again, I'm trying to take both sides in court here uh, where we've had where we didn't want to tell them ahead because we were afraid they were already weren't taking care of our horse very well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And we were afraid, OK, this horse isn't even going to get fed at all if we tell them. So mm-hmm. there are those, but they're extenuating. They're not, usually Correct. if you want out as a boarder, the the place or the owner of the farm is wanting you out too. I mean, correct, right? I correct. mean, it's on both yeah. sides. You're both dancing, but you both want the same thing in the end. So you're absolutely yeah. right about that. And I have been in one of those bad boarding situations when I had my first horse as an adult and I laugh, like I still actually feel, have like guilt over the whole thing for being at this bad barn and feeling like I didn't do right by the horse because I chose the wrong place. But you know, that's, that's for me to work out yeah, elsewhere. I, mean, I, do too. <laughs> I, I do too. I, I still feel the same there. Well, this has been a fascinating, co- and you know who has had to do this, not necessarily with boarding and with horses, but Ashley, you're a military spouse. You've done this a hundred times. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I do have friendship friends still from where we've lived all over the world and and some I don't. And that's OK. You know, it's OK that you were a friend for now, but maybe not a friend well, forever. You have acquaintance acquaintances every point in your life, everywhere you are yes. now, you have acquaintances. Very. I mean, we make very few true friends in life. Totally, totally. Right? I mean, unless there's an exception to that, but, I, you know, I don't think there is. I think if we all counted of good, good friends, I mean, friends you could call up today and it's, you always know because you can call up today and it's like you talked yesterday and haven't talked in a year, right? Mm-hmm. Those right. friends, there's probably a dozen. We all probably have a dozen. If we're lucky, yeah, right? If we're lucky. Yeah. 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 You're right. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure I could count a dozen. I have to include yeah, you and too I always in that because uh, I I'll always be in trouble if I don't. Very, so. <laughs> I always joke my bar for friendship is also pretty high. Like kind of having um, coming from the background I do, I always am like, no, like my measure of a friend is if I call and say I need a shovel and a tarp, no questions are asked. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> and and or, or if they don't show up with the shovel and the tarp, you know, at least they're not reporting me. <laughs> Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you for the good conversation this morning. You can find that article, A Note on Business and Friendship in the Horse World. Uh, Deanne wrote it. It's uh, December the 7th, 2023. You have to scroll back a little bit. Go to horsenation.com to check that out. Deanne, thank you for joining us again and stay warm there in Pittsburgh. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's always fun. All right. Take care. That was interesting conversations today all around. I know. Yeah, I love that. Your horse has unique feed needs and Purina has you covered from breeding and growing to senior horses, from performance horses to easy keepers and everything in between. Purina has an extensive portfolio of research backed options for your horse. There's no shortcut for quality nutrition. Cheaper isn't cheaper if it doesn't work. Put Purina's research to the test. Find optimal nutrition at any level at your local Purina retailer or visit PurinaMills.com to learn more. Well, I have a Horses in History. It's from an article I read recently about an excavation in 2014 where they found the stables of the great Emperor Augustus, who lived about 2,000 years ago, and they discovered, of course, under a car park in Rome because they were digging it up. And I think you dig anything up in Rome, you're going to find something. Uh, so the stables, they, what they found was the stables that housed the horses for the Circus Maximus races. Uh, we've all seen movies about that with the chariot racing and all that stuff. And this was built during Augustus's reign. And it was declared one of the most important discoveries because they had never really, they haven't found a whole lot of stable complexes like this. Uh, you know, a lot of stables, especially for the poor folks in Rome during the Roman Empire were made of wood. So you just... They were disintegrated and you never found them. These happen to be made of marble. So they also had a ton of graffiti on the walls. Not the spray paint kind, the Roman kind. Uh, (laughs) And they were, you know, it talked about the races. It actually kept track of the racing teams and things like that. It was pretty cool that way. Um, So it got me down a rabbit hole of, how did the Romans take care of their horses? What were the stables like? And all of that. Apparently, the they did a lot of what we do today. The Romans were were very smart crew. they cleaned their horses with coarse palm leather gloves. Think about the gloves we use today, right? Mm-hmm. Horse hair brushes, sponges, wooden knives to scrape sweat, and wooden scrapers. 
Uh, horses were covered with rugs at night in the stable. They actually had their version of a rug. Uh, the mane and tail were washed with aromatic oils. We kind of do the same thing today, Fancy. right? see. <laughs> we kind of do the same thing with all of our lotions we have for our horses. Yeah. Um, they trimmed their manes uh, on the left side so that their hair fell only to the right. They kept their manes on the right side. Uh, very often the horses, uh, they didn't cut the mane at all and they really let them grow. Um, uh. And they only took off the ends. The lips were also softened with oil and water. The hair in their ears were also cut. They did cut the hair in the ears, which I thought was interesting. They probably thought they could hear better that way. I don't know. <laughs> um, after each work, get this. Does this sound familiar after shows? After each work, the horses were washed down with exceptional care for the legs. It was thought good to stroke and pat young horses while they eat in order to establish a bond between them and man. I mean, how much of this positive sounds, reinforcement? I mean, this, this is yeah. It sounds like today, right? No kidding. Yeah, especially the gloves. You know, we have an advertiser that makes those gloves now. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, they're probably not made out of the same thing anymore. But you know, <laughs> same concept. Uh, the main ingredients of their food were straw and barley. One of the historians uh, of that period writes that the daily food ration was fifteen Roman pounds. Sometimes hay and wheat were served. In the spring, it was recommended to use a cereal forage, but it was advised, however, uh, to bleed the blood of the horses during this diet. Huh. I don't think we do that anymore. Okay. So, <laughs> so, Going to pass yeah. on that? <laughs> Maybe not give them that diet in the first place would be a better <laughs> idea. In the summer, horses were fed pure barley and released to the fresh grass for the whole day. During the winter, the horses were fed with peas in, uh, for the evening meal uh, for better digestion. Peas? Yeah, peas, I guess, were plentiful. And if you think huh. about growing peas, it's easy to grow peas yeah, in that's great true. quantities, right? Yeah. Um, so peas were something that, you know, unlike an onion, we onions always drove me nuts. And I hated planting them in the garden because you plant one and you get one. Right. Yeah. Whereas peas, you plant one and you get, a, you know, a hundred. So right. <laughs> grains were not used typically in that time. Just, I guess... People ate them and they didn't think Yeah, I was going to say, they yeah. were too busy eating it themselves, I suppose. The custom of feeding horses alfalfa was transferred from Persia when they would, you know, conquer different lands. Oh, sure. The Ottomans, I guess, yeah. huh? So that's where the alfalfa came from. And the Romans were very good, and this is not just true of their horse care, but they were very good at when they conquered somebody. They did learn from the people they conquered, and they incorporated a lot of what they learned into their households, their their running of government, and all of that stuff. Um, so they they were very, and you know they were very smart. You think about the aqueducts and the, they had the best roads yeah. in the world, and you know they knew their their scientists and their engineers were very good. Um, and the Roman stable was practical and cleverly thought out building. It was made of brick walls with grooves. Straw was used as bedding. The floor was constructed from paving stones or oak wood. Uh, the stable was very clean, and the bedding changed every day. The horses were separated by beams or by wood, basically, into stalls. Mm -hmm. um, and they had hay and straw ladders in the stables. And what they did, similar to today, is they had, you know, they had an, uh, they had a floor above the stalls okay, and a yeah. loft. And they would just drop the hay and stall down from the loft. So that kind of the same way that we did it today. Um, now, they divided their, their horses into 17 what they called specifications. So what they did is they, of course, it's the Romans. They had to have lists like you do. Um, <laughs> so, so the Romans were very big on lists. And so what they did is classified each of their horses into what they could do for a living. So the horses were judged by what they were best at, kind of similar to what we do today. Uh, and the, some of those specifications were horses to the road which meant horses either to pull a wagon or horses to ride on the road for transportation, combat, of course, racing, hunting, packing, postal. Apparently, they had horses that were used for delivering messages and things like that. So, you know, your fast horses probably. Mm -hmm. Coach horses, again, the ones pulling the wagons and the coaches. Uh, truck horses, uh, that's classified, you know, pulled the, the work wagons around. Uh, a teacher horse or a trainer horse. That was actually a classification for a school, school horse. Yeah, there you go. Oh, my gosh. That's what that was. They had schoolmasters back then. And the horse of the triumphal chariot. So, obviously, your chariot racing horses and you would have been 
pretty exclusive to the the big fancy yeah, pants exactly, ones, the expensive mm-hmm. ones. And then uh, a rider's horse accompanying a cart at the games. No idea what that is. Um, a drag horse that was to drag stuff out of the woods, like wood and you know, mm. drag stuff to construction sites and things like that. Probably your heavier drafty types. And then donkeys. Uh, donkey were just classified as donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't just call the ugly horses donkeys. No, they, they, were they were legitimately donkeys. <laughs> they were donkeys. But they also didn't call them by a job because probably the donkeys did a little bit of everything. Yeah. They were very versatile. So, uh, And in addition to the Roman Empire, ancient Egypt is also known to have having really cool horse stables. The world's oldest stables were discovered in 1999 in the ancient city of Quantir Pyramis Pyramis in Egypt. They were established by Ramses II in 1304 BC to breed horses for war, hunting, and recreation. They were the largest ever found covering, get this, this is the stables, 182,000 square feet and housing 480 horses at a time. Okay, Ramses did not know he had 480 horses. He just called them all horse. Like, you can't <laughs> name that many horses. I'm sorry. Okay, but you, that was just one of the stables, you know? Do you think it was pyramid-shaped? No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> but they, it was made of block, or we wouldn't have found it, right? So, right! Yeah. So that was the largest ever found. A uh, lot of horses back then. A lot of horses. But they had to take care of them all, right? Yeah, and you know, now I've spent a lot of time in Rome when we lived in Italy, and there are still horses pulling carriages. Granted, they're full of tourists, but uh, they're still there. (laughs) They're classified, (laughs) let me see, uh, they would be horses to the road. And and they're they're out there doing their work, man. (laughs) Well, there you go. There's a little bit of Roman history for you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Ashley, for filling in today. Really appreciate it. A little bit about this week. We're going to have a best of episode for you on Wednesday because Jamie's still off. And Ashley and I are actually heading tomorrow. We're heading to Orlando for PodFest. We'll be at the podcasting conference all week. It's your first podcasting conference, right? Yes, it is. I'm so excited to, first of all, get out of the frozen Midwest. <laughs> yes. Let's be very it clear. It is supposed to hit the 80s again this week. We've been cold, too, but uh, you're bringing the warm weather. So it'll be in the 80s. You might even get a little time around the pool. That I mean, don't tell my boss that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's happening this week. And then we'll be back with you with uh, a full load of shows next week. We also this week have the Chi episode tomorrow. So that's a brand new Chi episode about uh, Eastern medicine. And I have a brand new Horse Husbands episode that we recorded last week for you on Thursday. So we do have a bunch of shows coming up. I hope you enjoy them. Have a great week, everybody. Enjoy where it's getting warmer. And Ashley and I are going to hang around for a post show. So all the auditors. Stay for that.